Hello and welcome to another review. I'm back with Josh and uh, this is a review we've been planning for a while. We've been talking about doing this movie for quite a long time and uh, we're sort of prompted to finally do it uh, yep. because unfortunately George Romero has passed away and we're talking about his underseen film, uh, Martin. We'll talk a little about uh, why it's underseen for various reasons. Yeah, I, well people asked when we did Dawn of the Dead, Mike and I were did Dawn of the Dead, and I, ta I mentioned the fact that it's not commercially available anymore, okay. and I think some people don't understand why that might be, because that's one of the most famous horror movies ever. Yeah. Uh, but the backstory is that the producer of that film and this film, Martin, Richard Rubenstein, he owns the rights to it, mm. and he's just asking a ridiculous amount to license both of these yeah. movies. And it's weird because I, I certainly noticed that, I mean, everybody's seen, you know, the pile of, of Dawn reissues where it's just like all these different editions and all the this and that and the other thing in Martin a couple editions on each format maybe if you're lucky I do have the VHS oh so here's the <laughs> an old uh, big box VHS version of Martin uh, <laughs> and then this was the Anchor Bay DVD that came out god I don't even know 12 14 years ago yeah uh, and then there was a, another DVD maybe 10 mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. and then that's it and that one has the wrong aspect ratio. But yeah, let's get into uh, what Martin is for people that don't know. It's a vampire movie. George Romero, of course, most famous for zombies, but this is his similarly kind of skeptic view of the world's uh, take on vampires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's everything that you know about vampires apart from uh, vampires drink blood, that's the only thing that Martin does. Yes. That's a vampire thing. It's a very laid back movie. It's not very driven story wise, yep. but the basic story is that Martin, uh, he gets uh, off a train into Pittsburgh. You're Martin Matthias, I'm Kuda, come. We must take another train. He's moving in with his cousin, mm -hmm. who's way, way older than him. I always, yeah. I always had in my mind that it's his uncle, but it's his cousin. It's his cousin. So his cousin picks him up at the train station, and they go back to uh, the cousin's house. His name is Kuda. Mm -hmm. And Kuda lets him in the house and says, Welcome to my house. By the way, you're a fucking vampire, and eventually I will destroy you. <laughs> vampire. First, I will save your soul. Then... I will destroy you. And you're like, what? <laughs> what is yeah. this family? What is this relationship? <laughs> yeah, it's very uh, front-loaded in terms of just everything you need to need to know is in the first 15 minutes. Yeah. Hungry. You may come and go, but you will not take people from this city. If I hear of it a single time, I will destroy you without salvation. And yeah, you're a vampire. You're 84 years old. I'm going to save your soul. <laughs> and then destroy your body, and you're gonna have to come to work tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> come work in my shop. Yeah. Uh, uh, I told my, grand, my granddaughter who lives here not to talk to you, but she will. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat her, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so these are our family dynamics. Yeah. And the, the basic idea is that Martin may or may not be a vampire because he doesn't have fangs, mm -hmm. he can see his reflection. Uh, as he keeps telling his uh, cousin, there is no magic. Yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not Nosferatu. Nosferatu. I am your cousin, Martin. You see? You see? You see? It isn't magic. Even I know that. There's no magic in the world, which is like the ultimate George Romero thesis statement yes. that runs through all of his yeah. work. And he says it in such a, and we should point out, that it's a very like somber movie. It's yes. a very kind of sad movie. And uh, Martin is, is played by John Amplis, who's been in a number of, uh, of uh, George Romero movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, most that notably, one. including Creep Show. Um, <laughs> Not that you know it. <laughs> as well as uh, he plays a Puerto Rican on the rooftop in the beginning of Dawn of the Dead. God, that's right. So that <laughs> happens. He he plays Martin, and he plays him very. It, it's it's an interesting performance, and it's the the performance that kind of carries the whole movie mm -hmm. because 
he does some horrible things. Uh, as a, his version of a vampire is, he doesn't have fangs. He uh, sedates these women. Right. And uh, uses a razor to cut their arms, and that's how he su drinks their blood. Mm -hmm. And so these are horrible things, but then you see him in these scenes where he's not doing that, when he's just kind of wandering around Pittsburgh or working in a shop, and he, he has such an innocence to him. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's really good. See, it has two blades, a real one and a slip blade. You hold the real one and pull the slip blade up. Things only seem to be magic. There is no real magic. And as you kind of learn throughout the movie, you kind of learn more about, because at first you're like, why does his cousin think he's a vampire? Where is this coming from? But you get to more, uh, you get to learn more about their family. He is young for Nosferatu. There have been nine such accursed in the family. There are three still alive. Martin is one. And right. his history, and how this has almost been like pounded into his head his whole life. Martin had his father until he was 32. Grandfather, he is just a boy. Look in the books, Christina. We had the books of the family. Did you ever look? Of course, the books. The books will show it. Those damn books, they should be burned. That's where you get your horrible ideas. Ask the boy himself. Ask Martin. He will tell you. He's unbalanced. He's mad, and you and those books have driven him to it. Yeah, the important thing is that yeah, is that his family believes. Well, not even you know, um, Christine, the, the the younger, the uh, other cousin, because they're both cousins and just generations apart. Right. Um, but she doesn't even believe it, so it's down to Kuda and Martin. But if they believe, then it's ultimately true for the movie, yeah. whether it is or not, because everything that happens is a consequence of that. Um, but yeah, like if you take away that that vampire idea, he's a rapist and a murderer and is awful, but he's completely sympathetic throughout the whole movie. And I don't know if that's just because, you know, obviously he's the protagonist, but if that's because he's trying to understand himself throughout the whole thing as well. Like he's, he's got some things locked in, but other things he's still, it seems like he's trying to figure out yeah. how to fit himself into a real, a real world. And you have, uh, there's, there's a lot of religious themes running through the movie. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, it, it's not like a, an attack on religion or anything because you have George Romero himself shows up as a priest. <laughs> He's like a young, hip priest. Yeah. And then you have Kuda, who's this older guy with these ancient kind of ideas yeah. of, of his religion and his values. Do you believe in demons, Father Howard? Do you believe the devil can enter a person's soul? <laughs> I don't know what to believe about that. You don't know, Father Howard? <laughs> You see, this is what I mean. This is not what an old person wants to hear from a priest. And there's this wonderful scene where he invites George Romero over to dinner and they're <laughs> chatting after dinner and, and, and Kuda is like just talking about, you know, his, his family's history and their religious beliefs. And Romero's like stifling laughter and like trying to, you know, be laid back about it. I think it's a difficult issue. It's something that has to be dealt with. Grandfather, stop it. You're going to scare Father Howard away. It's a fascinating subject, actually. You should talk to Father Zulimus about this. You know, he went to see that film, The Exorcist. He said they did it all wrong. Zulimus. I don't suppose you saw that movie. I thought it was great. I love that. And then he pushes him off on the older priest. When he <laughs> He's like, yeah, you should get to talk to this like, guy. Yeah, and the older priest comes over and does some rites, and Martin just kind of stares at him for a while, looking uncomfortable <laughs> until he... Yeah. Until he just leaves. So Yeah, so it, it definitely fits in with Romero's other movies, which are always kind of about kind of frustration at a lack of progress mm. as far as like ideas and, and uh, I mean, that's the, the Living Dead movies are about a new society devouring the old one. And right. this movie is very much kind of in that same vein, but with more vampire and religious themes. Yeah, and also um, kind of lays the, uh, brings the, uh, the sex part of the vampire uh, lore to the front, very obviously. Like, it's always connected to sex. Well, the opening scene on the train sets up the entire movie perfectly, yeah. which is, one, it establishes sort of romanticized idea of how these things go, or sort of the black and white flashbacks, which is yes. like, he's about to, he's on the train, and he's about to break into this woman's room to, to kill her and drink her blood. And right before he opens the door, we cut to this wonderful black and white moment. And then we cut back to reality. She's in the bathroom. She hear, you hear the toilet flushes. <laughs> she comes out with like a, a, a whatchamacallit? Like a face like, mask. Like a face mask. And she's like blowing her nose. <laughs> <laughs> And 
and so before she passes out after he's, he sticks her with the needle, she's just like saying these like, oh, he's like, you fucking bastard. <laughs> yeah. Some sort of freak rapist asshole. I think I really just noticed, noticed it this time around, but the, the way the editing pace changes there. Yes. Like initially it's really pretty frenetic. It's just quick cuts. And then once he finally is in the room, past that first flashback, he's in the room and the tempo slows way down when the action starts up. Yeah. And so that's a really interesting way to kind of settle you into the tempo of the movie. It's just like, things are gonna, things are gonna happen, we're not gonna look away, yeah. but it's gonna be real in a lot of different ways. Yeah, well, and then there's even, to that, that whole sequence, there's even a money shot. Blood just pours on him, and it's 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 sexual and disturbing. Absolutely, and that's intentional. But yeah, like you mentioned, the editing. Uh, I always say, like the the best aspect of George Romero's kind of craft is his editing. Yeah. Um, and when Mike and I talked about Dawn of the Dead, we talked about how sloppy the actual filmmaking is, just yeah. because it's something on that scale. And I don't mean that as a bad thing, but it's like, you know, low budget movie, limited crew. We're shooting right. in this mall. We have limited hours. They were just kind of running and gunning and getting what they could, and then he made it all work with with his wonderful editing. Right. Uh, and this movie also has great editing, but I think because it's a smaller scale, You're able there's to... a lot more focus on the shots and the craft of the filmmaking. Yeah, it's such a, it's such a, I mean, it's only got a few locations. It's not a huge story, so you're able to just focus in and tell. Like, it still looks, you know, cheap-ish. I mean, the blood is, well, it's more tomato soup. It's, it's colored. yeah, that, it's the same kind of Dawn of the Dead, yeah. uh, vibrant red. Like, yeah, oh boy. <laughs> well, speaking of the blood, uh, we should mention Tom Savini. Yes. Who uh, plays hunky boyfriend in this movie. Uh, this is my cousin, Arthur Thalanis, Martin. Hello, Martin. Indianapolis, huh? It's a good town. Well, I hear there's work there. But he also did the effects for it. And uh, I've had, since I was a little kid, I had his book called Grand Illusions. Mm. And uh, it's interesting because I was doing effects that he utilized in Martin before I had ever seen Martin because of that book, because I had that book. Sure. And there's a whole chapter on Martin and the, like, the simplest effects, like that you'd be like, duh, now, but as a little kid, it was like, like movie magic. Yeah. Like the whole, you know, when he slices the arms, it's just, you know, a little like bladder with blood and you run a tube behind the razor blade and the razor blade's dulled down and you just yeah. squeeze it out. Simple thing. I, I, I think I have footage, if I can find it, I'll play it here. Footage from a movie <laughs> I made when I was in probably fifth grade. Oh man. Of someone cutting their arm just like that. <laughs> and then we utilize that same effect again in the recover years later. Yep. It's, a, it's the simplest trick, but it, it's effective, it yeah. works. Tried and true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there aren't as many, obviously, because it's telling a smaller story, there aren't as many set pieces uh, really just kind of the the, 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 the arm cuts yeah. for the most part, but for what they are, they are very grisly. And it kind of underlines that idea that we're talking about, that Martin's not good. Yes. Well, speaking of set pieces and editing, mm. we should talk about the what I think is maybe the best sequence in any Romero movie ever, which is the home invasion that oh. happens about halfway through this yeah. movie where Martin is sort of, because he goes out of the city to get his victims, to because that's what Kuda said to do. Mm -hmm. um, so takes he's kind of- train out. Takes to... the train out, he gets some ice cream and kind of watches this woman, sees her husband leave. And I, I think he overhears her, the husband say that like he won't be back for another day or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there's a business trip involved. Yeah, so, so in Martin's mind, she's there all alone, sneaks into her house, opens her bedroom door. Okay. Who are you? Well. Oh my God. Uh, Let, let's not get uh, excited about this now. That's no reason to get upset now of anything, okay? I don't know him! And then that guy's like freaked out because he thinks that Martin must be your husband or right. something. And then she's like, I don't know him. <laughs> oh, and that's like, ooh, like it gives me goosebumps. Just that idea of like, like I don't know who that is. Yeah. He's in my house. Louis, I can't call anybody. You are not supposed to be here. What am I supposed to do? I don't care who finds out about us. He shot me with something. Uh, but that entire sequence then where, yeah, it's like a cat and mouse throughout the house. Yep. Hey, Ferguson, can you give me the number of Mercy Hospital, please? Thank you. <laughs> Shit, it's fucked up. Wait a minute. I gotta do it again. <laughs> I can't get through. I forgot the number. <laughs> Um, well, that's, yeah, all the, the business with the phone, where yeah. it's like he picks up a phone in one room and she's trying to dial 911. Louis, are you on the other phone? Louis! He's just like pushing buttons and fucking with them, and just like the pacing of the cutting back and forth, it's it's really like, it's so, like the editing is so precise. Yeah. Hang up! Oh my! 
Hang up! I'm off! I hung up! I got my foot on it! Hey, there's another phone in his house. Downstairs in the game room! And the sound effects are very weird. I don't know if that's realistic for that era, but it's like this <laughs> beep boop, beep boop, boop. It's yeah. very bizarre. <laughs> And then he finally managed, uh, the, the, uh, boyfriend or whatever, the, the, the affair having man, uh, finally manages to get outside, but then Martin tracks him down in the woods. You weren't supposed to be there. You weren't supposed to be there. You weren't supposed to be there. It really just slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's like it reminds me of uh, uh, like a Fulci, like like the zombie, the eyeball going into the sliver and yeah. zombie, yeah, just like really so takes slow, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's really <laughs> just uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> and he's it, 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 it almost just kind of feels like Martin's just it's more of a it's, it takes him longer because it's more of a punishment and just yeah. kind of here is how I have to wrap this up and I didn't want to do this, but well he feels betrayed in a way. Yeah. he has he has like a relationship with these women even though they don't know him. Yeah, it's completely in his head. They're his victims and through the, as I mentioned, the black and white flashbacks, they show that he has sort of a romanticized idea of all these, these events. And so, yeah. reality seeps in. Uh, speaking of reality and romance though, uh, Akuta runs a deli and one of Martin's jobs is to deliver uh, various packages around to you know you know you could just call and have people bring meat to you back in those days. Uh, <laughs> they have to walk there, but they'll get there. Exactly. <laughs> and one of the customers he runs across is this lonely housewife. You remind me of an old cat I used to have. I mean that to sound funny. I had an old alley cat. He used to sit on the floor and stare up at me with those eyes. <laughs> He just listened and listened till I got it all out of my system. He never said anything either. That's her character overall. She's wrapped up in her problems. Yeah. And is just kind of fighting to make her way through life as it stands. Right. And so she starts to flirt with Martin really just as a, just something to pass the time, it seems like almost. Yeah, that's the interesting part. It's not like a romantic relationship. It really, the whole thing is just so sad. Yeah. I mean, the movie as a whole is just so sad. Yeah. I can't have kids. I can never have kids. I have something wrong inside. What do you think? Is that good for me? Or bad for me? No opinion? That's why you're so nice to have around, Martin. You don't have opinions. Uh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a tenderness to it, though, still. Oh, sure. For, for the both of them, there's solace in, in that. And that's, again, him trying to relate to the uh, to the outside world. I'm sorry. I'm the complaining old housewife. If you don't like it, get out. Hey, I don't mean you. I mean me. Yeah, that sort of like inability to move on kind of plays throughout the movie too. Like yeah. talking about the sort of outdated uh, kind of religious beliefs of Kuda. And then you have like Christine uh, played by George Romero's eventual wife. I leave tomorrow morning with Arthur. Oh, but don't worry, we won't have any offspring. We won't even wind up together. Arthur is just my way out. Yeah, her talking about wanting to get out of town and she's leaving with, with Tom Savini. And mm -hmm. she, she's like, she even admits, like, he's not, we're not gonna last, but he's my way out. Like, yeah. he's my excuse to get out of here. You'll forget about me. No, I won't. Why do you think I forget? Because you're going away. People always go away so they can forget where they were. The third act as such is really pretty short. Yeah. Because... Well, it's very abrupt. Like, a lot of the major... I don't want to give too much away because I want people to see this movie. Yeah. But all the major events happen, like, one right after the other. And yeah. then it's just over. First, like, the first act is obviously introduction. He's getting settled in. But the second act is really about him starting to lose control. Yeah. And he really, and he, he starts to get a little sloppier and a little sloppier as the time goes on. And then he seems to be distracted with um, his, his potential budding relationship yeah. that may or may not be a thing because everything is pretty ambiguous in Martin's life. <laughs> <laughs> but the way it's shot, I was, in rewatching it, I was thinking, 
Because there's a lot of shots of Martin just sort of like walking around town. Yeah. We get some like straight on of him and it's a slightly wide angle shot. Mm -hmm. And like I was thinking like so much of the movie looks like like a 90s indie rock music video to me. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's just bizarre, like, and like the way he's dressed, mm -hmm. like he looks like someone straight out of the 90s. Yeah. It was so weird. Yeah. But also like that sort of grainy aesthetic, which was just, that's just because it was a low budget movie at the right. time. Right. You look at like music videos from the 90s and people were intentionally doing mm -hmm. that. And yeah, but that actually does seem to contribute to that immediacy as well, where he's um, like he's down by the train tracks and the camera's not locked down. It's a lot of handheld stuff. Yeah. And that's just kind of just, oh, look at that thing. Look at that thing. Look at Martin. Yeah. So it, that helps keep the pace up when he's just wandering around, not doing anything. It really just gives you a great sense of where they are. Yeah. And it's not a, it's, it's, it's a depressed area and it's old. Yeah. And so it fits in with, with Martin. And the, the mood is set great too with the music. I, I, I don't think we even mentioned Goblin when we talked about Dawn of the Dead. Oh. Well, that we overlooked that. One of the most famous <laughs> wow. things about the movie. But uh, this movie in particular, like I love the score. Mm -hmm. It has a very sort of like 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 gothic kind of romantic sound to it. With a which lot is of space. A, yeah, with a wonderful and that's such a like nice juxtaposition between the you know the really then contemporary kind of shots of of Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. Although there is a cut, the uh, the uh, Italian cut has a Goblin soundtrack, apparently. Uh, oh, really, of Martin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was unaware of this. Yeah, which is all like repurposed stuff. Like they didn't write anything new for it. It's like repurposed stuff from okay. other records of theirs and Suspiria, apparently. Oh, weird. Like, so you get some of the same music cues in that, which is weird. Um, I, can't, I can't imagine this movie without this score. It's I really, know. it's just like haunting and beautiful and perfect. Yeah, it really fits it well. Yeah, and it just creates such a sense, such a mood and such a, like a gloomy mm -hmm. kind of gothic atmosphere in a movie that otherwise isn't particularly gothic, except for some of the black and white kind of flashback stuff. Well, there's that, and then the uh, the, the the scene that Martin mocks up in the playground. Oh yeah, with Kuda. which is great. Just him completely mocking Kuda yeah. for his beliefs. <laughs> yeah, there's fog everywhere, and Martin's got the, the complete vampire getup, and just his face is painted white, and he's got the teeth in. It's just a costume. One of my favorite things about the movie is that it remains ambiguous throughout the whole thing, and there's never a tip either way, because it doesn't, it's like, like I was saying earlier, it doesn't matter, really. Yeah. You can put whatever you want into it, it matters that Kuda believes he's a vampire and Martin believes he's a vampire and that's it you know no, although... that's, that's an interesting dynamic too because they both believe but at the same time Martin's trying to he has more of a like a grounded view of it yeah uh, and Kuda, Kuda kind of has this old timey view of you are Nosferatu and he's you know has the garlic hanging on the door and all that yeah and so Martin like clearly you know he has a bloodlust he might not be a vampire in the traditional sense mm -hmm. but but yeah, he's just constantly trying to convince Kuda that this is all bullshit. Yeah, he's the he's the modern version. Yeah. He doesn't really explain how they became vampires, right? It's just like a family curse. It's just yeah, they just say it's a curse that's been passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. So it just means that like these ancestors of these people, they've always been fucked. Yeah. <laughs> I mean they, that this just keeps getting and that's what I think is so kind of tragic about Martin is like if you view it from the idea that he's just you know, a normal person that maybe has some some sort of mental illness mm -hmm. that runs through his family, and he's just had this beaten into his head his whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just a, you know, it's a question of have they been just confusing this mental illness with uh, vampirism? Exactly. Yeah, it's entirely possible. But that's kind of a funny thing too that it flips on its head with the uh, vampire tropes. Is it's always the the vampires always have the bevies of young women, and the woman that Martin ends up with is you know at least uh, looks wise physically. Uh, you know, a good uh, 15, 20 years older than him. Mm. Just the typical suburban lonely house. So I, yeah. That reminds me, we got to talk about the other main character in this movie, which is horribly ugly 70s decor. <laughs> that yes. really stood out to me watching it this time. Yeah. It's just like everything is so ugly. And it's 100% authentic because they just, <laughs> they just shot, shot in these in, houses. They shot in like, it's, it's the sound guy's grandma's house. 
Okay. Yeah, it's just like it's his it's his grandma's house. The books of old family pictures are his grandma's family. <laughs> so it's just like this is just what's there. Yeah. So there's no there's, there was nothing to mock up. This is the way it is. And the 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 home invasion sequence, like when he oh. the, the door to the bedroom, and there's like wallpaper over <laughs> yeah. it or something. And I was like, what is this? It's a secret door. <laughs> what is how does that work? <laughs> I think it really helps to kind of drive that home to where like that's supposed to be the fancy house. Yeah. But Kuda's house is, you know, is is definitely lived in and like and has been that way for many years. <laughs> <laughs> it's like just as you know, it, and it helps to kind of drive drive that setting home a little better, I think. Yeah. Just almost intentionally. Yeah, I think aside from probably Night of the Living Dead, this movie is has the most sort of atmosphere to it of yeah. any of Romero's movies. Like all these all the it's it's such a weird contrast that I love between the vampire, kind of classic vampire, kind of gothic feel just set in these sort of run down old Pittsburgh houses. Yeah. Well it's when you take when you take all of the power out of the vampire story uh, you get just vampires are the ultimate outcast, and that's yeah. what Martin is. He's just he's outside of everything. He's outside of his own family. He's he can't fit in, yeah. and that's a sad situation. Like it's he wants to connect. Hmm? Yeah, it's it's in the the uh, the filmography of George Romero. So many of his movies, almost all of his movies, are built more around the concept than they are. They usually have like memorable characters, oh, yeah. but they're not. I would I would never call them like like a character study, aside from this one. Yeah, this is the so only it's, one. It's, it's unique in his filmography, but at the same time, it has a lot of the same sort of themes and attitude of his mm -hmm. other stuff, especially the the just general skepticism at the world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, I, I love it. It's really a beautiful tragedy and pretty unique in that. I can't think of another movie that's really like it in Romero's uh, filmography. Well, and horror movies in general. That's There's true. not a lot like, like this tone. It almost feels like a... Like a Richard, if Richard Linklater made a horror film or something, like the the really yeah. laid back attitude, and sort of the the realness of it all. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Actually, that's one of the things Linklater hasn't done yet. Yeah, he's never he's done, done just about movie. everything else. Although I did recently, for the first time, see uh, Before Midnight. Before whatever the third one is, yeah. the most recent one. That's kind of like a horror movie. Well, because that's essentially <laughs> marriage is fucking terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I w and I will say that about Martin is that it's it's got a, just an overall sort of just tragic, depressing feeling, and it, it so you have to kind of be in a mindset to, you know. Well, yeah, wallow Romero in the world goes back and forth. I mean, Night, Night of the Living Dead kind of falls into that category too. Dawn of the Dead yeah. is, of course, the goofy one. That's the heroic there, there's, one. There's, yeah, I mean, there's a sadness <laughs> underlying it, but it's yeah. such a fun movie too. I mean, you got zombies getting pies in the face, right? But then continuing that streak of. Uh, I, I keep saying skepticism because that's what I think of when I think of George Romero. But well, more cynicism. Well, it, it, it becomes cynicism, yeah. and that's the interesting thing. Like Martin is sort of I would call skeptical, and then you get to like uh, Day of the Dead, which is just sort of about giving up yeah. on any sort of like uh, belief in authority. <laughs> By the time you get to Land of the Dead, like that movie is uh, literally ends with them saying, "You know what? Let the zombies just have it." And so there's this this kind of escalation throughout Romero's entire career. Well, and it's and it's it's kind of a theme like because again like you're right in not not calling these like character studies but uh um even though they're not particularly character studies there's always really good writing and dialogue oh sure and um it kind of it occurred to me kind of the same thing at the at, towards the end of martin where christine is leaving and she's like you know i'll call i'll send money i'll, I'll keep in touch i won't forget you and she's like you you'll, you'll forget me yeah that one got me yeah <laughs> yeah it's like that's that's kind of the same the abandoning thing mm -hmm. is is throughout a lot of his movies. So just thinking of George Romero overall and just his, you know, what he did for film is incredible. I, I think a lot of people don't quite realize like how much of an impact he had. Because mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 unfortunate later in his career how like he had so much trouble getting movies made. Yeah. Uh, when everybody else was just ripping off. Him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it took it took a remake of one of his movies to get him in a position where he could make another movie. Like that's fucked up. Yeah. Well, I mean, and part of it is is you know surely that he didn't he didn't want to make dead movies anymore. He didn't want to remake the same movie over and over again. Right. So he wanted to do different two different you know he wanted to tell different stories. But that's that's kind of like uh, you know he sort of flirted with doing the Hollywood thing. Mm -hmm. Never really worked out just because I think that's his 
the way his brain was wired. I mean, yeah. he was he was he was an independent artist through yeah. and through, and that's why one of the reasons that he was for me. I mean, when I think of like filmmakers that have had a real impact on me, there there's you know top three or four, and, mm-hmm. and he's certainly up there. Yeah, and people don't realize the the you know. The, the impact he had just on non-horror film in, in, in general as well, just because there's just like techniques of filmmaking, casting. I mean, doing the, it independently. Yeah. And that's kind of, I, I always, I like regional filmmaking. Like when you watch a movie and you can tell that there's sort of a community behind yeah, the making sure. of it. And a lot of Romero's earlier stuff, and especially in something like Martin, yeah. you can really see that. Yeah, it's very, very in, in and of that town and those people. Yeah, this is a Pittsburgh movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's absolutely. It's he was able to make his kind of movies. You see that crap? All that horror crap? Bang! You're dead. When there's no more room in hell. The dead will walk here. only seem to be magic. There is no real magic. <laughs> They're coming to get you, Barbara. It gets up and kills. The people it kills get up and kill. Are they slow moving, Chief? Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. I mean, it's real hard to live for something that you believe in. 